gender? Good question. Gender is complex and experienced differently by everyone. We hope that over the next few minutes you'll gain a new appreciation for different ways to understand gender. All of the characteristics we perceive as related to gender are influenced and constructed by the society in which we live. Context, such as place and time, impacts how we think of gender. Our location in the United States, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and even within Harvard in the 21st century influence our conceptions of gender. Individuals elsewhere in the world today, or at Harvard 200 years ago, may have or have had completely different notions of gender. That being said, at Harvard today, people most commonly break down gender into three dimensions. First, gender expression. Gender expression encompasses all of the ways that someone expresses themselves and their gender outwardly, such as the clothing they wear and the kind of activities they participate in. Someone may present as masculine or feminine, meaning they display qualities that have traditionally been associated with men or women, respectively, or they may present as both masculine and feminine, or neither. There's nothing inherent about one's gender expression, such as playing football or wearing dresses, that makes them more or less belong to any particular gender. As a society, we have arbitrarily decided that those are things that men or women are supposed to do, or wear, or say, or be interested in, but it could have turned out differently. The second dimension of gender includes one's physical characteristics. This encompasses a variety of biological features, such as hormones, anatomy, depth of voice, or where and how much hair someone has. Someone is usually assigned a sex at birth, such as male or female, based upon observed physical characteristics. But much like gender expression, the concept of sex is also socially constructed. There are plenty of women who have body hair or are muscular, and there are a lot of men who are short and have high voices. Some women have XY chromosomes and internal testicles, but they're insensitive to androgen and testosterone, so they present as biologically female. Who is to determine what this person's sex is based off their biology? Sex isn't as clear-cut or natural as one may think. The third dimension of gender is gender identity. Most simply, gender identity is the answer to the question, what gender am I? There are many different answers that someone could provide, including but not limited to woman, man, genderqueer, non-binary, or someone may not identify with any gender identity at all. Pronouns are often talked about in relation to gender identity. They are how you describe someone when you're not using their name, and people can take a variety of pronouns, such as she, he, they, z, or someone may not want to be referred to with pronouns at all. For each individual, these three dimensions influence each other differently, and the ways in which they relate to someone's gender vary. For some, their physical characteristics are extremely important for grounding their gender identity and how they correspondingly express themselves. For others, how they dress and express themselves may be more important to understanding their gender identity than the sex they are assigned at birth. Even within these three dimensions, people may emphasize some aspects of themselves more than others. For example, someone may find that the pitch of their voice affirms their gender identity more than their genitalia. The opposite may be true for someone else. Every person has their own understanding of how these three dimensions influence each other, and that understanding is determined by their experiences. Gender also intersects with other aspects of one's identity. Ideas about what people of certain genders look, act, and behave like are informed by race, class, religion, sexuality, ethnicity, geography, and a bunch of other intersecting identities. In this video, we have focused on gender, but doing so does not signal that other aspects of identity are any less important. But what does all of this mean for how we conceive of gender as a whole? There are a few models out there. You may have heard of the gender binary, for example. This is the idea that there are two opposed poles of gender, man and woman, and individuals have to align with one of these poles. In the gender binary, there are only two gender options, which does not capture the nuance of gender expression, physical characteristics, and gender identity that we've discussed. People have pointed out these limitations of the gender binary and proposed an alternative model, the gender spectrum. The gender spectrum is the idea that there are still two poles of gender, but each individual sits somewhere on a line between these two poles of man and woman. However, 
Even the gender spectrum assumes that there are set notions of what it means to be a man or what it means to be a woman, limiting each person to thinking of themselves in relation to ideas of manhood or womanhood that may not fit with their experiences of gender. Alternatively, at the Harvard College Women's Center, we think of gender as a constellation. A gender constellation recognizes that a person's gender expression, physical characteristics, and gender identity don't necessarily have clear boundaries or normative points of clustering. While some people's gender characteristics may all align or fit into one cluster, many people's do not. The gender constellation is about letting the messiness and complexity of people's experiences sit in the open. It leaves space for traditional identities like man and woman, while allowing other identities to expand in all directions. It also helps illustrate that gender is not one-dimensional, nor is it an either-or choice that the polar models prescribe. The gender constellation allows room for individuals to identify their gender the way they experience it, and therefore is a more inclusive way of understanding gender identity.